So welcome everybody to the session. The next slide, we will have an overview of what we will discuss today. Um, so I'll give some brief information about the Interact Northern Periphery and Arctic program, how the, uh, and then we will go into how the program works, what topics you can work on in projects, um, how do you know if your idea is a good fit, where to get guidance and more information, and the next opportunities to get involved uh, with projects. So let's get started. So the Interact NPA in short, and this is going to be very brief because we're going to be focusing mainly on priority three uh, today. But basically we're an EU uh, program, an Interact program that has been around for more than, uh, well, almost 25 years, I believe. So it's, it's been a long cooperation. This newest program, uh, 2127, uh, was approved in September last year. And uh, this is the program area that we're working with on the screen. And it's a combination of countries inside the EU and outside the EU. As you can see, um, if we start from the, the east to the west, we have Northern and Eastern Finland. We have Northern Sweden. Northern Norway as part of the program, uh, the west of Ireland, and then all of the Faroe Islands, Iceland and Greenland. And then on the next slide. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting combination of countries and regions. And what binds it together is um, that they all share a number of challenges and opportunities. So they, there are some similarities, for example, that they are generally sparsely populated, that there's a harsh climate, um, that there's long distances uh, between settlements, long distance to market also for companies. Um, there's an aging population, but on the other hand, there's also um, a very uh, pristine nature in general, an abundance of natural resources and a rich cultural heritage. And the program area also has uh, two groups of indigenous peoples. So um, because of the common challenges and the shared opportunities, this is uh, these offer opportunities to find uh, innovative solutions and um, uh, to cooperate on these topics basically between the different regions and uh, find solutions to become more prosperous and resilient as it's saying on the slide. So this is the, the main sort of rationale behind the program. And then I'm handing it, up. yeah, the, the financing. Um, so the total budget available for projects is almost 47 million euros. And out of that, uh, almost 40 million euros for EU partners, so partners from Finland, Sweden, and Ireland, and then uh, 6.8 million euros for non-EU partners, so from Norway, Iceland, Faroe Islands, and Greenland. So that, that's one of the sort of special features of the program is that uh, it's an EU program, but we also have uh, the, the countries outside the EU putting their own money into the program to make cooperation between these countries possible. Um, out of this, we have already allocated about 28% because we already had two rounds of, of main project applications. So that's where we stand at the moment. And it differs quite a lot between funding sources. So uh, if you are planning to make an application, it's always a good idea to check uh, with the regional contact point from the countries of the partners you want to involve and uh, check what the situation is. And with that, I'm handing it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, I will, uh, as briefly as Kirsty, try to take you through how it works uh, to uh, develop a project, apply for funding, and uh, run a project with the Interreg NPA program. Uh, first things first, as Kirsty described, uh, these countries decided to work together based on common um, challenges and opportunities. Uh, so the starting point is that you see there is something in common, so it might be a problem or it might be an opportunity uh, across these regions. And 
I hope you will pardon me for uh, the very basic example, but I think it's a good way of explaining uh, what we mean. So one common feature is that Nordic countries are experiencing long dark winters. So a shared problem is we are in darkness for a long time of the year. And somebody has an idea how to address this problem. And it could be something like making light bulbs. The person who has the idea would like to address it and would like to find qualified partners to work together, people that understand what it is to be in darkness for a large part of the year. And so the next step would be to go and look for partners to work together who have different competences, who have different skills, and who have different experience of working with light bulbs, can be designers, electricians, etc. And once these partners uh, all agree that it could be a good idea to work together, they should check if the NPA is the right program to support their idea and turn it into reality. And I'm saying this because there is a, a number of uh, European, national, and regional funding programs that might be a good fit for supporting um, cooperation projects. What is very specific about the Interreg Northern Periphery and Arctic program is that we span across a large area that is the Northern Periphery and Arctic. So what we look at is really transnational challenges. We are a unique opportunities for people in Ireland to work with people in Greenland or in Northern Norway or on the Faroe Islands. And this kind of collaboration is not possible at cross-border level, or maybe it's not possible on the same foot on um, research programs. On the same uh, level, we are not equipped with supporting pure research projects. So when applying to the uh, Northern Periphery and Arctic program, we should really consider if we are the right program for the kind of activities you want to do and for the kind of geography uh, you want to work with. Once you have decided that this is the right program to apply, then you work together with the partners to develop your idea and um, craft a proper project application. Which takes me to the next step, that is how to apply for funding. At the Northern Periphery and Arctic program, we regularly open call for projects, and there is one open now. It's the third call that we have opened. We usually open calls uh, twice a year in the spring and in the autumn. And for each call that we open, that is the, the period when we invite um, projects to be submitted, we define terms of reference. So we set the conditions for uh, presenting your projects. And uh, in some cases, like in this one, there are specific conditions that apply to certain priorities, like we're going to talk about later for the specific themes of priority three. So it's a very good idea to carefully read the terms of reference and to read the other documents and support and guidance that are published on the call um, webpage. Once you have become familiar with these documents, you can finalize your project application. There is a template that you can use to do that. And you can also use a pre-submission checklist to verify that all the eligibility and quality uh, criteria that we describe in our documentations are met in your project uh, application. And then you can go on our online system that is called GEMS and submit your project application, which we will receive, read carefully and assess based on a set of criteria decided by the monitoring committee of the program. If you're lucky, then your project will be approved and you will be granted European funding as well as funding from um, the partner countries, Northern, uh, well, Norway, Faroe, Iceland, and Faroe Islands. Um, one word of caution is that when the project is approved, the grant is not paid in advance, but it is paid upon um, reimbursement. So, Projects have to have financial capacity to advance their cost for the first year or so. Once you're approved, though, you can carry out the work that you have planned together with your partners. And you do that with your partners as well as with your target groups or end users. These are the people that you think will mostly need the light bulbs, for example. And by the end of the project, you will have 
finalize your light bulbs, you will have produced them and you will want that they are used and built up in the streets and in the houses so that nobody lives in the darkness anymore. So you put your solution into use and you will have achieved an impact brightening the darkness in the north. This is just the example, but the idea is really that the funding from the Interreg Northern Periphery and Arctic program can um, bring people from across the seven countries to bring their ideas into concrete solutions for the people who live in the Northern Periphery and Arctic program. This was a brief overview of the steps that are necessary for um, participating in the NPA program. And I will now pass over to my colleague. Thank you, Michaela and, and uh, Kirsty. What topics can you work on? Um, we would be remiss in not pointing out that what we're, the main part of what we're talking about has it follows along with some other priorities that we have. Of course, we'd like to focus today on priority three, but there are three priorities that we have in the program and, and um, those pri priorities and specific objectives that we have in our current program on the slide that we now see is that there is some overlap um, and, uh, and overlap for a very specific reason because across the northern periphery area there's similar problems and so we would like to address in this programming period as we have in our previous programming periods as we've moved forward over time um, to, to look at innovation and bringing SMEs in, into our work and climate change. Adaptation is a very important theme for us and sustainable um, resource management. And these are core in what we, we're looking for from you in terms of seeking um, innovations. And within these innovations I just mentioned um, from the previous program, we're still looking to further promote these solutions, whether it be in digitalization or disruptive technology, support for um, SMEs, and focusing on the sustainability as we have done in the past to promote us moving in, in transitions forward. And that could be also seen through circular economy and, um, and becoming more prominent as we move forward in this, this program period. But in addition to those sort of foundations that we have have in our, in our program this time is we've got an additional priority which is one that we're asking you to think about and this is why we've encouraged you to join us today is dealing with organizational capacity and the use of cooperation opportunities in into the northern periphery and reinforcing for the the linkage in the collaborations in the communities if i could go to the next slide please this is our first priority and I'll briefly say that this is about strengthening innovation capacity in remote areas in our communities uh, to, so that we can attract more businesses, people, and act as a, a role model, as it were, for sustainable living conditions in, in the northern periphery. And, and through building this part of our pro program in terms of adaptive capacities and resilience, we're achieving um, through plans that we have, uh, which have been passed out to all interreg programs, is that we're moving towards being a smarter Europe. And this is one of the first policies of the European uh, European uh, cohesion policy objectives. If I could go to the next slide, please. A second one of those European cohesion policies was dealing with um, a, a greener Europe. And here we're, we're addressing uh, climate change and resource efficiency. And here, we want to bring leaders together to, to approach the issues around a greener, more sustainable um, communities with low carbon solutions. And I mean, there's a vast opportunity uh, in our communities to think about using indigenous knowledge that can be brought together in transnational cooperation. In both of these um, priorities, we have three specific objectives, and I, I won't go into those right now. You can read about more of those uh, in our program manual, as um, Michaela was, point, uh, was suggesting that you could do, and, and we'd encourage you to really have a good understanding of, of our program manage, manual. But what's more important is to move to our, our third priority, uh, which is what we're calling cooperative 
opportunities. And in this new priority for us, we're, we're linking the values and the dimensions of, of our program in this priority to figure out mechanisms that we can continue to do the work that we're doing in, in our communities. And we see that we as a program, the Northern Periphery and Arctic, have a role in starting to help greater or further the, the cooperation that we have in the Arctic. And this can be done through various arenas, um, not only across projects, but between projects and also between programs. And we have a sister program here in, uh, I guess, the Northern Periphery, as it were. Um, it's called the Aurora Program. It's a cross-border program. And we speak with them quite oftenly. Um, often um, in, in our programming and their programming too. So it's important to know that it's not just us as a transnational level, but also as a cross-border program level that we're making our communities be more cooperative and work together. And so priority three for us um, offers this opportunity. With that opportunity, we've approached our monitoring committee and we said to them, this is a very important uh, priority for us and one that requires um, some extra work. And so we, we approached them and said, well, we've got some ideas and can we have a chat about some ideas? And if I could take us to the next slide, this is where you come in as, as people that are interested in um, priority three, where we have some thematic focus in priority three. And we came up with three sort of key points um, for focusing in priority three. And the first one, of course, is to um, increase the preparedness and the resilience of, of communities. And here we're looking for projects uh, that will share their experiences to build their capacities in one or more of areas, such as the operations of search and rescue or building preparedness of local communities and security of supplies. Many of you may live on the very periphery or the upper periphery of the northern periphery and will understand what happens when the local ferry breaks down and there's no supplies coming. So we see this as, and the monitoring committee agrees with us, that um, this is one of the five that we should be asking you to be thinking about when developing your ideas. The second one is to uh, preserve um, the experience and the uniqueness of the heritage of the northern periphery and, and Arctic. And here, we have some ideas, um, some topics that we'd like you to consider in terms of sharing your experiences in building capacities uh, around cultural, uh, culture, heritage, natural heritage, as well as using the local and uh, minority languages to, to think about resources and how to increase the awareness. And of course, some of that can come through tourism. The third um, focus that we have is increasing the, the well-being of people living in the Northern Periphery. And here project ideas could be around building capacity in terms of improving health, healthcare services, healthcare in general in the community, as well as in mental health. As, as we've learned through the pandemic that we've recently all come through, we've learned a lot about uh, mental health and isolation and loneliness in our community. So, the monitoring committee said, yeah, this is, this is a good idea. Let's, let's see what we can do with increasing the well-being of people living in the northern periphery areas. The fourth focus for ourselves is that of skills and talent needed in the northern periphery and Arctic areas. Uh, we were recently um, in Shalefia where we learned about a project that's in a pilot stage, when I say a pilot, it's a multi-million dollar project that's being organized by a conglomerate of um, energy and mining companies in Shalefio to create and make uh, carbon-free steel, but they have bigger ideas outside of that. And of course, what comes in that is that they're going to make this plant in their area. They're going to need to attract the skills, develop the talent of people living in there. So here we're looking for, um, projects that will be sharing experiences and building capacities uh, towards jobs and skill demands um, in their areas and to meet that transformation in their communities by attracting and retaining different skill sets and talents, which is always a challenge at the best of times. And then finally, the thematic theme, the fifth one, is that of enabling the youth. And the topics we're thinking of here is about sharing the capacities again 
of increasing youth participation in regional government, establishing um, what we would consider, and as we experienced at our most recent conference in Abudo in Norway, um, the experiences of, of youth networks and the initiatives that they have and the impact they have on their regional and local uh, governments and connecting youth councils and indigenous youth organizations across the periphery. So these are the, the five sort of th thematic focuses and, and the topics that we think you could be addressing. If I could go to the next slide, of course, to get these topics going, we have to have some target groups that we'd, like, we'd encourage you and give you some food for thought, as it were, in terms of people that you should be approaching. So our, our first target group, we sort of gave the title, well, we need to look for resilience. And we're looking for municipalities and networks of municipalities, um, because this, these were seen um, in the first theme, uh, theme of, of increasing preparedness and resilience in our communities as potential um, um, target groups to be looking for when developing your, your project idea. In terms of heritage, and the experiences and uniqueness of the uh, cultural heritage that we have, networks of Samis, Inuits, communities, building them up to hold on to their traditional way of life and expanding it and sustaining it. In terms of well-being here, this is a very important area for us. And as we know, there, there are underrepresented groups in the program areas, such as young, vulnerable people and indigenous groups. And here we'd ask you to start to think about, well, who are the people to attract here? Um, where do you go from? And as a target group, the, um, the monitoring committee saw that this was a very particular group relevant to the well-being theme. In terms of talent, here we have a sort of a broad um, involvement of different stakeholders to be expected. And when we say broad, the, the monetary committee really didn't pinpoint any specific target groups, but the broad involvement of any groups. Um, and of course, here as giving the example that um, with what's going on in, in um, Sculectio, um, they're looking to then they want to build up resources, human resources in their community. So this is why it has to be broad and thinking about you know employers or, or groups of employers. So that the, the group is just not limited to it's as, as far as you want to take that. And youth. In terms of the target group of youth and enabling youth to be involved in sharing um, what's going on in the uh, Northern Periphery and Arctic, we would encourage you to to source out, and we've been doing quite a bit of work in sourcing out recently our um, organizations that involve youth in the Northern Periphery. And if this is an area um, that you're interested in going into in terms of developing a project, please do get in contact with us. Um, Lucia has been working quite diligently in identifying and mapping um, all of these, these groups that we can see from, or we know of now, from Finland across to Greenland. So it's a very useful resource that we've developed there. So I've just given you an example of, of or not examples, but I've given you a walkthrough of what the thematic focus is and the, and the types of the, of the groups. I'd like to now switch gear a little bit and switch over to the next slide, which is about the purpose of why we're doing this. And it's basically uh, to build on the capacity of engaging stakeholders in cooperation to build um, on their local knowledges and develop it further and, and for us to support them in their strategies for the northern periphery and Arctic. And those strategies are something that will develop over time. There may be some strategies already in place in your regions. And of course, that's um, a, found, a, a further foundation for us to be working with. But along with this comes with what we expect from you. And we've got a series of activities that we want you to be focused on because at the end of all of this, um, and when you're doing your application, you want to be measuring yourself and we want to be measuring ourselves against uh, what you said you're going to do. So we're looking at building organizational capacity, building on know-how and shared experiences and developing uh, shared strategies, coordinating strategies, um, and so that we can empower our communities to go further. And of course, with that, there's the underlying sort of effort that has to be done in, in terms of communicating. 
in looking at those activities, of course, they all lead into what we would call deliverables. And here you're going to be doing some studies, you're going to be developing your networks, establishing networks, strategies, action plans, jointly developed, and possibly some solutions. We're not sure what kind of solutions you may come up with, but the point is, is that when you're working together to build your capacities, you may discover, hey, we've got a solution here. And that's something that's very good to be marching forward with. If I can ask us to go to the next slide, please. Of course, no program or project would be worth its weight at all if it didn't have view on what their output should be and what their results should be. And we're very careful in crafting what we have done for priority two, uh, sorry, three, is that in outputs, we're looking for strategies, pilot actions. And then, of course, as results is the uptake and the scaling up of the strategies and the pilots going forward into the future. So we'll be looking and working with you closely to develop these, uh, the outputs, knowing that you're going to be having them taken up during or at the end of your project. Um, I, we have some ideas in terms of, of or I have, we have some ideas in terms of what we think it should be, but this is the really first time that we're having a crack at priority three. So when we get your applications, we'll be working, if you want to work with us in the regional contact points, we have this, this is in mind for us, is this, you have to be having a, a starting point based on the, uh, the um, thematic focus and your target groups, putting them into action, getting some deliverables and activities, which will lead to your outputs and then on to results that we can measure and then go forward with. And hopefully that will be the case is that some of the actions um, that you do do are taken up and upscaled in different organizations. And all of these outputs and results will hopefully move towards making our communities stronger, more resilient and sustainable. So I'd like to say thank you at this point and pass over to uh, Kirsty, who's going to tell you a little more about how to do, how do you know if your idea is a good fit? Thank you, thank you Christopher. Kirstie. Thank you. Yes, uh, if we could move on to the next slide. So this is a, maybe a little bit of a recap of all the information that we've already shared with you, but um, we would encourage you to look at our program manual, but also our cooperation program. Uh, in particular, if you want to learn more about the priorities and see where you fit in, we have a description of what we, the purpose of the priorities are, but also what types of activities we're looking to fund and what types of target groups they are uh, targeting. And um, for priority three in particular, we have now elaborated on that in the terms of reference for this third call. So that would be for priority three, the best source of information. Uh, so, so check where you fit in, where you think you can realistically uh, contribute and um, yeah, that, that if you're in doubt, you're free to contact us or regional contact points. And, and as Michaela was saying at the beginning, um, also consider that um, the, the sort of underlying uh, uh, purpose of this type of funding is regional development. So we're not a, a research program or a, a culture program or anything uh, that might exist besides that. That might be a better fit depending on what you want to do. But um, we have resources and information available to see if you can fit with us, and we hope that you do. If we could move to the next slide, please. So um, in priority one and two, we're mainly uh, uh, looking to fund what we call main projects, and the, their main purpose is the development of solutions, really. Um, and in priority three, for the time being, we're mainly looking for small-scale projects, and there, the idea is to build the capacity for cooperation uh, and, 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 and include new uh, stakeholder groups in the cooperation experience. And hopefully, after trying that out on that level, eventually there is a more capacity to go for a main project. But uh, it's also completely acceptable that it stays at the level of the small scale project because it's it's meant as a sort of lower threshold type of project for participation of 
of groups that maybe normally do not feel that an EU program is for them. Uh, and especially because we have uh, so many specific topics, as, as Christopher mentioned, the five focus areas now um, that uh, maybe require a bit more uh, um, trying out, testing, exploring. And that's exactly what this funding is for. Um, if we go to the next slide, another difference between these two types of projects is that in, in, in priority one and two, the main projects are, are bigger and in scale. So they uh, generally run for 36 months. They have an average budget of 1.5 million euros. And um, the way that it works in terms of claiming the funding is that they submit six monthly reports uh, where everybody needs to submit their expenditure mm -hmm. to a controller and it's, it's a it's a more elaborate procedure than for the small scale projects uh, the, the projects uh, in priority three uh, will be half that time so 18 months and a, and a smaller budget up to 200,000 euros total budget um, and in the application, you will have to draft a realistic budget. But when it comes to claiming the funding at the end of the project, um, it will be handled as a lump sum. And that is a much lower administrative procedure. Uh, there will, we will not ask for um, exact expenditures or receipts. It will, uh, we will, in the application, together with you, agree on what you will deliver at the end of the project. And, when you do, then we will pay out the, the lump sum. So it's a it's a simpler procedure, but it does mean that it will only be at the end of that period that the money will be reimbursed. So you should be aware of that uh, when you apply. So I think we can go to the next one. Um, so another thing to keep in mind, uh, this is transnational program. And what that means is that we would like to see uh, at least three out of the seven program partner countries participate in your project. And they should be at least from two of the zones of the program area. And, and you may think, what are the zones? So we have one zone, uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway. And we have a zone, Ireland, that used to be a bigger zone. We hope it will grow again, but it's just Ireland for the time being. And then we have the North Atlantic countries, um, so Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland. And in order to not be a cross-border program, we ask that you at least uh, include two of the three zones. So it can't just be Finland, Sweden, Norway. You would at least have to include a North Atlantic country or Ireland in your application. Another thing to keep in mind that at least one of them must be from an EU member state. Um, and that the lead partner must be a public organization. So those are the minimum requirements for uh, priority three or for main projects. It's actually the same requirements. So this is good to keep in mind when you are building your project idea and thinking about, um, yeah, if you want to apply or not. And I think that's um, the last slide for me. And then I will hand it over again. Thank you. Um, so we've been sharing really a lot of information with you and um, it um, might be helpful to know where to find uh, all this information for you to look um, more um, carefully and with a little bit of calm. We have a dedicated call web page. Mitzia has been posted in, in, the, in the chat already, the link. And this is the web page that you can use as your main source of um, information. You will find um, the more strategic document that we have mentioned, the cooperation program document, where you can read about the priorities. You will find the program manual, where you can uh, read through all the conditions for participation and what is a lead, lead partner, what is expected from a lead partner or from a partner. And you can also find all the information about the types of projects and the duration and so on in the program manual. What you will also find in the dedicated call web page are the terms of reference and all the templates and, and the guidance uh, documentation that you need to develop your project idea together with your partners. 
So um, this is your first uh, starting point to find uh, the documentation to develop your idea into a project and then to submit an application. But for any questions, you're always welcome to contact your regional contact point. This uh, is a person who speaks your language in the first place, so it's already very helpful to clarify the most difficult questions. And they are very well informed about the program, they're in, uh, specialists on the ground. And um, they would know also if there is any specific uh, conditions at uh, national level that need to be met, for example, about receiving um, funding. And uh, we have three regional contact points uh, in the meeting today, but you can find all their contacts on our website in the contact section called regional contact points. And you're also always welcome to contact the Secretariat, especially when you have questions about the relevance of your project idea towards a priority or a type of project, or if you want to have any clarifications uh, about uh, quality criteria or processes or anything uh, really so uh, you can contact us at any point uh, we have also developed some um, opportunity to exchange ideas among yourselves uh, we have created uh, what we call a gem board this is a, an online whiteboard uh, where you can um, simply log in you don't even need to log in you click on the link and then you can click on the small icon of a sticky note and you can write there an idea, a suggestion or an organization that you would like to suggest for cooperating on, on, on some topic. We use really this as a, as a place for you to browse for ideas or to present your organization very briefly to find somebody to work with on a theme that you have an interest in. You should be aware that this is a platform that is operated by Google, is completely public, and so whatever you share there should be public available information. You shouldn't share any sensitive or restricted information in this platform. And if you decide to publish your email, which is a good idea if you want to be contacted, then you should know that this is going to be published online and accessible to whoever has the link that has been shared with you now. Still, since we're not meeting in person and don't have the opportunity to meet for coffee and exchange on ideas, we wanted to offer this possibility online. We also have another possibility for exchanging ideas that is to complete a project idea or partner search form. You can find the link to this template on the call dedicated web page, and you can more um, in detail describe your idea. And if you're looking for a partner or if you're looking for advice on how to develop your idea, and this template can be shared with the Secretariat, with your regional contact point, or with the regional contact point of another country uh, where you're looking for partners. Um, we hope you will find this uh, useful for developing your project idea. And last piece of information and some uh, reminders about some important uh, dates coming up. Our third call for projects is open. This means that we are open to receive applications and it has opened on 17th of April. We have organized additional trainings and uh, in particular on the 2nd and on the 3rd of May, you have the opportunity to register to what we call project clinic. These are individual um, time with the secretariat where you can discuss your idea in a very specific way and ask specific questions uh, that, you, that you have in preparation uh, of your project. Uh, we have also planned a training specifically about submitting project ideas on GEMS, that is an, an online monitoring system, is extremely intuitive and user-friendly. So depending on the number of registrations that we receive for this event, we might decide to replace it with some tutorials, but in any way, if you have registered, we will contact you and we will assist and provide all the guidance that you need for submitting your application in GEMS. The most important date of all is the 26th of May, because this is the call deadline. 12 o'clock noon, the system will shut off. It will not, not be possible to submit applications anymore. The machine is absolutely ingenuous. It closes at 11.59 noon, not in the night, midday. So please be prepared, uh, start working your application form online well ahead of this deadline. 
once the call uh, will be closed, we will be going through all application. Uh, it's not only the Secretariat, it is a collective effort also involving uh, regional um, assessment groups. And on the 27th of September, the monitoring committee will meet and decide on the projects that will be granted funding. So there is still some time, but it's not a lot. I will now then bring leave the floor over to Christopher for the next Thank opportunities to be involved. Much. Thank you, Michaela. As, as Michaela was pointing out, those dates are very important for you to, to be mindful of. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, but also, as uh, I believe as Michaela mentioned earlier on, is that we do have an ongoing series of preparatory project calls and main project calls um, that get slotted and agreed to um, by the Monitoring Committee. And so our next autumn preparatory project call is coming in, starting in um, August, August 23rd, we're going to open it, close it in September, a month later, and then decisions will be made um, on the 30th for both six month and 12 month projects going forward. But knowing that, you know, some of you may be a bit pressed for time or whatever the situation may be in your organization, um, or organizations that are coming together in your collaboration to present a, um, a small scale project, we will be hosting again a fourth call for main projects, and we'll open that up in October, close it in November, November 17th, and then decisions will be made in March next year. So that's for if you're not ready for, you You think you're there, you're not quite there, you know that there's some, something else down the road. Not the preparatory projects maybe where you want to go, but with the fourth call that will open, um, we will be having a monitoring committee meeting, as you realize with the decisions on, um, some calls that are going, that's now in place. Um, and at that uh, monitoring committee meeting, we will be making, we will present a, a new or well, forthcoming um, fourth call in terms of reference. And inside of that, the monitoring committee will give us some guidance as to what we need to do going forward based on efforts and everything that's going in in the program and the program projects being um, um, decisions being made, etc. So by the end of September, we will have a terms of reference to get ready to go. We we'll more than likely give a little information about that once it's been approved by the Monitor Committee. And then October the 4th, the call opens for the fourth call. As you may have heard a number of times, though, we do encourage you to visit our website. Uh, this is where we put all of our uh, information. And if you're not on our newsletter, uh, you're welcome to with this uh, link here, use that to go and join on our newsletter and get updates ongoing when, when the newsletters go out with new information. A very useful um, tool for you and, and the regional contact points users quite often to share with other uh, people that are interested in the program too. So that's some information about upcoming calls. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody. That sort of ends the part of our presentation. Um, and we can now say thank you for listening and open up the floor for um, any questions.